When I started working with data, I started working with Microsoft SQL Server, and I've been working with the Microsoft Business Intelligence stack ever since. Um, and I've kind of done a little bit of everything from requirements gathering to ETL to building the cubes and all sorts of different things throughout the process with reports. So uh, today we're going to kind of talk about uh, Power BI and Excel 2013 and what Microsoft is really trying to offer with going a different route on offering business intelligence solutions. So I guess my first question is, who here is familiar with like BI solutions or just working with business intelligence in general? Okay, I see a couple hands. So if you've been working with BI solutions before, how many people have worked with like MicroStrategy or business objects? Okay, quite a few people. Has anyone here worked with uh, Microsoft BI solutions? Got a couple more hands. So uh, narrowing down a little bit on that, has anyone actually done uh, reporting solutions out of just Excel? Okay, I see a couple more hands. And what about Power BI in general? Is anyone here familiar with it? Okay, we got a few people. So yeah, I'm just going to kind of talk about um, generally what you know business intelligence is from uh, offering a solution perspective, um, and then we're going to kind of talk about what Microsoft is offering, uh, trying to be more agile, trying to be more receptive to what the business needs nowadays. So when we talk about what is business intelligence, the first thing that Gartner defines it as is a uh, category of applications and technologies for gathering, storing, analyzing, sharing, and then uh, providing access to that data to really help the enterprise make better business solutions. Now, that's really all it's about is just trying to help the business, uh, you know, either get a leg up on its competition or learn its market better or its customers better to help capitalize on that uh, to, you know, further revenue, further, you know, drive down costs, different things like that. So. Um, when we start talking about business intelligence, one of the things we want to remember is that it first starts out with data. Now, what is data? That is That in, helps the enterprise uh, be able to record events. That can be sales figures, cost figures, um, how much you're paying, your employees, different things like that. And we can get it from many different places. Uh, we can get it from databases. We can get it from Excel files. We can get it from our line of business applications or custom apps that we build ourselves as well as you know, enterprise systems, you know, data is everywhere. And everyone always talks about how it's exploding with big data and Facebook and Twitter and all sorts of different things are coming up nowadays that's providing us with more data. So once we start out with data, where do we go from there? Well, we start getting information. And that helps the enterprise be able to respond to events. That's when we start putting it in graphs and pie charts and bar charts and different reports that are going to help our users really make a difference and help them make better business decisions. So once we have information, you know, that's where a lot of companies are nowadays. But where most companies would like to be is gathering knowledge. And that is being able to predict what's going to happen and anticipate events in the future within the enterprise. So, you know, you're trying to, instead of just seeing what's happened in the past, you're trying to do trend analysis, you're trying to predict, you know, what are my numbers going to probably be next year so I can be a little more accurate. Um, so that's kind of, you know, business intelligence in its raw form. But uh, we work with business intelligence every day, and we may not even know it with some of the things that we work with. Um, a common example I like to use is going out to Google or Bing. And so when you go out to Google or Bing, one of the first things that you uh, type in is that you may start typing in something and it'll start offering up predictions for what you, they think you're going to want. That can be based on demographic data that they've gathered about you. That can be based on uh, maybe popular trends that are going on at that time. So for instance, uh, this is one example where I just typed in how. And the first thing that popped up is how I met your mother. Now, I haven't been a big fan of the show recently, and it's kind of stopped last year. But maybe that was popular at the time uh, when I, you know, maybe a lot of people were watching reruns, and that's what they wanted to see. Or it may know my demographic information and that I'm a young professional, and it may know that I kind of struggle with tying a tie occasionally. So that's the second suggestion it offers. Or maybe it even knows somehow through uh, business intelligence that I don't know how to draw at all. So. <laughs> That's one of the other suggestions it might offer. So that's just one example where we don't, we don't even really recognize that we're working with business intelligence you know, at a very fast pace that companies are using against us to help draw us back to their search engine. 
One more example I like to use is Amazon. Amazon is one of the biggest proponents of business intelligence, and that's with upselling and selling more products. Uh, one of the examples they have is the today's recommendations for you. Um, based on your previous buying pattern and based on other information they have about you, they know that if you bought these certain items in the past and other people have bought them as well, you're most likely going to want to buy these items too. So that's one way they can upsell. Another way is that they like to pair different items together. So they know that when you buy a wall outlet that you're probably going to want a USB charger with that because I always feel like I use, lose all my USB chargers. So there's a, there's a couple different ways that business intelligence impacts us every single day. Um, so I've kind of gone through business intelligence a little just to give you know more of a brief introductory and I know a lot of people are already familiar with it but um, everyone who's worked with business intelligence does anyone have any challenges that they've come across in their day-to-day -day work? What, what, are what, what are some? I feel like I got, I feel a, couple like I got like a couple like to hear. Uh, our customers, they'll, they'll, first of all, we have unreliable, the, the tools are not 100% reliable. You, you get a system up and what happens is customers are given the power to write queries and stuff. So first of all, you run into, they don't know how to use the tools. Mm -hmm. okay, then if they know how to use the tools, they write really bad queries that will potentially take down the system. Right, right. Okay. And on, it all kind of relates to Yeah. Yeah. So, tools, so you know. yeah, so it yeah, so it sounds like it's just kind of giving users power that you kind of can take abuse of it and sometimes it can kind of you, there's no monitoring in place for some of that. Is that sometimes it's a surprise. It's a surprise, correct. Okay. Anything else? I find one of the bigger challenges we run into are hidden business requests. They don't really want to tell you what they're after to hide it from the marketplace, but they want the results. Okay. So okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's unclear um, search. You know what they're trying to find. They know what they want, but they can't convey it to the IT as well. Okay. Any others? So one of the ones that I've run into a lot is. Um, kind of the time, I think the time of getting reports to users and how they complain about, I want it now, I want it you know, fast. That's another one I've run into as well as maybe this could kind of go with uh, users kind of getting more access than they need. They kind of get the wrong data, they can't verify it, different things like that. So there's, those are just a couple examples that Microsoft has tried to address with Excel 2013 and Power BI. Um, and we're going to kind of talk through first the scenario of uh, how Excel 2013 can help answer some of those challenges as well as Power BI. But I kind of want to recap real quick. Microsoft offers a very broad, excuse me, a very broad array of technologies to help answer these questions. And I'll go through that in a second. But one of the big things that the Aberdeen study, the Aberdeen group did a study in uh, back a couple years ago, and they found that there was a couple big problems with BI projects and BI work in general. Uh, one of the things is it takes 143 days uh, for BI to work through the average backlog. So if you stopped any new requests for most BI, it would take 143 days for them to work through that entire backlog just to start accepting new requests so they could start working on it the next day. The next is 30 days is about the average time for IT to build a dashboard. Now a dashboard can kind of seem simple sometimes. It can be a couple different metrics, maybe a couple charts, and that's it. But for it to work through the whole process of IT, it can sometimes take some time. You have to work with requirements analysts, developers, you know, report builders, different things like that. And speaking of report builders, it takes on average eight days to add a column to a report sometimes within IT. So these are some of the challenges that a lot of users are finding from a business perspective that they want to address because nowadays it's all about getting business data faster and business decisions faster and making those decisions. So Microsoft offers up a broad array. The first is they like to offer some presentation capabilities and they do this with both traditional BI systems as well as new offerings like Power BI and Excel 2013 and additional add-ons. Um, they offer self-service capabilities as well as collaboration and mobile capabilities. Um, and then they like to start helping with enriching data. Uh, that can be done with more corporate uh, data quality services as well as the ability to get your data yourself through Excel 2013, which I'll go through. Um, the last thing is uh, data management and processing. They offer ways to store your data on both relational databases, big data clusters, 
as well as analysis databases and, and different things that help you analyze that data faster. So they offer a couple traditional and non-traditional approaches and they do it because they want to try to appeal to all groups. And that's really where they've started to, you know, a couple of years ago I, I used to give some speeches on the scalable BI solution. They like to give some users the ability, but they also gave BI professionals the ability and data scientists, and they still stick with that. Um, you can work with Excel 2013, and most people do work with Excel 2013 to try to derive their own BI solutions or their own reporting things, you know, at a fine grain that's just detailed to them. They also offer BI professionals some different tools such as reporting services and, and more robust reporting services capabilities, as well as data scientists with analysis services and predictive models. So we kind of talked about, okay, there's the traditional aspect of it. How have they decided to go about it with appealing to the business users? And this is where they're trying to appeal to a more agile mindset. They want to turn Excel 2013 into the BI tool of the future. And they do that with a couple different add-ons for discovering, analyzing, and visualizing, uh, giving the users that capability to discover, analyze, and visualize their data on their own, and then go maybe, once they've confirmed that they have what they want, they can start elevating it to a higher level to start refining it, making it easier to use, maybe backing it up more, things like that. So. One of the things that Microsoft does is with all their different add-ons, they preface it with power because they believe in empowering the user. So one of the first things is when you're going out to get your data, you want to give them an ETL tool. And ETL stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. It's extracting your data from where you want it, transforming it to something that's usable to you, and then loading it into another place where you can get easy access to it. And that's what they call Power Query. Power Query is able to query many different data sources and it's all in Excel so that it's easy for the end user to be able to go out and get what they need. You can query traditional things such as SQL Server, Teradata databases, Oracle databases, or IBM DB2. But they also support uh, more non-traditional sources that have started coming up through the pipelines. Things such as Hadoop, Facebook, OData feeds, or even Azure Blob Storage. Uh, they want to be able to give a lot of versatility to what they're offering. So once you go out and get your data, you extract, transform it, and load it, you're going to load it into the next piece, the next add-on, which is Power Pivot. Power Pivot is a self-service data modeling tool. What that does is that, again, in Excel, it gives the user the capability to kind of frame their data into a way that makes sense to them. So creating hierarchies such as the year quarter date hierarchy or the year quarter month hierarchy which is a pretty common hierarchy um, it makes it very easy to use it's pretty much a drag and drop for the most part another thing is defining kpis so key performance indicators um, this kind of goes hand in hand with adding analytic expressions because they've done this in a language that is very similar to microsoft excel it's not exact but for the most part you can sometimes copy and paste some formulas from Excel into a Power Pivot uh, model and it will perform the exact same way. So with KPIs, if say I want sales to go up 20% year over year, um, that's easy to do. It's, it's all you have to do is you define where the thresholds are and in the, you, know, you, have to take, you have to learn the language a little bit like Excel, but if you know Excel, it's easy to translate over to thresholds that are if it's below 80%, then you know, make it a red. If it's between 80 and 120, make it yellow. If it's above 120, meaning 20% growth, then make it green. Different things like that to make it easier for the end user to uh, build these things out in their Power Pivot model. So once you go out and get the data in Power Query, you kind of model it you know, to relate to each other in Power Pivot, then you got to visualize it with Power View. Power View is sort of their, it's their reporting solution within Excel. And originally it was kind of meant to mirror PowerPoint, which is done on a lot of different presentations. So Power View is um, essentially it's an interactive reporting tool that you can maybe click one area and it will dynamically change some of your other charts to give you a little more context. And you have different things such as the traditional bar graphs, um, line graphs, pie graphs, and even a map tool. But 
they wanted to give one more tool that kind of gave a little more context for a map tool, so they also released another add-on called Power Maps. Power Maps enables you to really utilize geographic data to a better extent, and that means that you can lay heat maps over uh, Bing maps. It integrates with Bing maps as well. You can lay heat maps and bar graph or column graphs over top, so you can kind of see multiple layers of what's going on, and it can give you a little more context. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of show you a little bit of how I've used a couple of these different add-ons with Chicago crime data. Now, Chicago releases all their data you know, open on the internet, and you can go, on, go in there and do analytics on it. So I asked a couple questions. I said, how has crime been impacted over the years? What types of crime are trending up or down? And where have these crimes been taking place? So I kind of wanted to just grab a couple different perspectives, you know, from the map point of view or how trends have been happening. And uh, I did it all through Power Query, Power Pivot, and Power, Power View. So I'm going to kind of go into that and show you now. Does anyone have any questions, by the way? So, so right here I have Excel 2013 opened, and I have a Power View chart set up. But first I kind of want to go into how I got that data. So up on the top you can see a couple different tabs for Power Query, Power Pivot, and Power View. Um, so what I started out with was Power Query. And from there you can grab get, getting external data from a bunch of different sources, and I went out and got an OData feed. So I'm going to pull up the OData feed that I got. And I got two different ones. I got Chicago crime data, and then I just got general information over the Chicago police stations. And you can see hovering over, it already gives me a lot of different uh, information over the columns I'm getting, uh, what kind of information, where it's coming from. So if I double click that, and let me drag this over real quick. This is what it looks like opening it up. So um, essentially what I did is I went out and I said, Chicago crime data, where is it? Um, it provided me with a link. And all I did was I copy and pasted that URL in, and it went out and it started grabbing data for me. So once I got here, I said, it goes back to 2001. I didn't want to grab that much data because that's a ton. So I put a filter on it, essentially, just to grab 2012, 2013, and all of this year. And you can see at the top that there's a lot of different uh, buttons to help you easily remove rows, remove columns, um, group by different things. They're really meant for the end user to be able to kind of work with the data and figure out how they want to use it. You can also do transforms. They have a bunch of transforms in place. So it's easy to kind of go out, get the data, and then if you want to start working with it, you can do that as well. So once I went out and got the data, um, I got about two and a half years worth of data. What I did is that I loaded it into Power Pivot. So Power Pivot again looks like Excel. It looks like an Excel workbook. You can see on the bottom I have my Chicago police stations, my Chicago crime data in my in my workbook, and it's pretty much set up kind of the exact same way. Um, if I go over to the right, I actually started adding columns. And what I did was, again, this is a, in an expression language that almost looks exactly like Excel. If I want to take the date with a date and a time, and I just want to make it a short date, all I have to do is say equal format, take that date column, and make it a short date, and that's it. It's really simple to do. And the same thing for you know the number of the month, the hour, because I'm going to use that in a report later. All I said was get the hour of that date because I want to make a different visualization with that. So once I went out and got the Chicago crime data, I got Chicago crime and police station data, and I went ahead and loaded it in my data model. What I did is I started building reports. And I wanted to build a couple things. I um, built some hierarchies out there. Oh, sorry. Let me actually display how easy it was to build hierarchies. So 
not only do you have the data view, but you have a view that kind of shows you the relationships between them. And how those different tables connect. So what I did is that on this view, I connected these based on the district number, because it was in the Chicago crime data and it was in the police station data. And then all you have to do to create a hierarchy is you click this button that says create hierarchy. And then near the bottom, you just rename the hierarchy and you drag and drop your fields there to create your hierarchy. So I have a year, month, day hierarchy. I have a geography hierarchy, and I made a hierarchy to show violent crimes. I kind of categorized some, and then what the primary types of those crimes were. And it was literally all just drag and drop. Um, you can use Power Pivot without, uh, there's ways to use Power Pivot without Power Query, but Power Query is really powerful within Power BI. Because, and I'll kind of go into this later, because you can start sharing the different data sets you've found with others in your organization. So just to remember, this was all in Excel um, doing all of this. So I built a couple different things. One, to try to find uh, how crime was trending over time. So I have 2012, 2013, and 2014, and we have different line graphs that show uh, it seems to be trending down as the years go by. And then I have, um, I made kind of a category for nonviolent and violent crimes and whether they, whether they resulted in arrests, which red is they did result in arrest and blue is they didn't. So if I want to go ahead and have these graphs interact with each other, all I have to do is click on one. And so I clicked on 2013 and it will dynamically change the other to show me what's relevant for just 2013 out of the whole thing. And then if I want to undo that, all I have to do is click on it again and it will go back. Now, if I want to go ahead and say, show me all of them that were true, I want to see how it impacts the line graph, I can go ahead and click arrest true. And it will dynamically change the line graph to show me that although 2013 was trending down in terms of arrests, it was about even with 2012. So that's just one of the ways that those graphs interact with each other on PowerView. Another thing I wanted to see was how crime is trending by kind of the time and the type. So I went ahead and I said, remember when I derived and I just said, give me the hour of the day because I want to just kind of see how it's done over throughout the day. I, I went ahead and built a graph that said, I want to see the crime by the hour. And we can actually see that crime is seasonal depending on what time of day it is. Um, it hits the valley at about five and there's a couple different crimes that are pretty much non-existent. And then it seems to peak at about 12, and I think it is 7. And so you can see how the crime is actually pretty seasonal depending on the time of the day, on what kinds of crimes people are committing or what is being reported to the Chicago police. So that's kind of how, but, oh, yes. So if, if I was walking in Chicago at 5 a.m., would you expect the hour? Uh, yeah, well, that may be the ones that you don't want to, that may be the ones where they don't catch them the most. So yeah, there's there's a couple. Again, it it it, it, it it's about it's about context. It's about context. So, you know, for the most part, no one's out at 5 a.m. So that's that's the reason why. It may be better to say instead of this kind of graph, do 100% stacked graph. And okay, let's see what's going on then. Yeah. So there's there's a lot about context that you have to show. But there's actually a really good feature with Power BI that you can start to explore those questions. So the last thing I wanted to see was, uh, you know, kind of just a map. What is going on in Chicago? So this can do it. I had it originally by state, city, but since I only have one city, I have the city of Chicago. And you can double click and it will start to drill down and it's doing this geocoding with Bing Maps. So by that, I go to zip code and it's showing me the different kinds of crime that are happening by zip code. And all you have to do is hover over and see what kinds of crimes are going on. Or if you want to see, I don't know, where is there more narcotics crime going on, it'll highlight those. And I don't know how easy it is to see up there, but it'll highlight that this has a bigger portion of the pie graph. And it's also the pie graph is bigger to show that there's more crime happening at that time. So that's just a couple of the ways that we can see 
you know, we saw how it's trending, we saw how it interacts with other graphs, um, we also saw how it interacts with Bing Maps. Does anyone have any questions? So that was all kind of done in Excel 2013, and now Power BI is about extending Excel to further help, you know, make it more enterprise ready, make it more um, usable, and also make it, you know, easier for people to go on, you know, quests to try to find different data. So, so a couple of things that Office 365 and Power BI does <coughs> is it helps you connect your data with your on-premise information more, and it helps you share it easier. They also have some features for finding information on your own just by asking natural language questions, as well as their supporting mobile integration with um, different applications. And, and the thing to remember is that Power BI is always iterating, is that it's always improving on itself. Um, just, I think last month, they just released a couple updates to Power Query and Power Maps and some of the Q&A stuff. So, that's one thing to keep in mind is that they're always, you know, kind of furthering those different features. So one of the big things with Power BI is the data gateway. So if you have a Power Query that you use with on-premise data, how does that connect with the cloud? That's what the data gateway is for. It's for kind of opening up a portal between the Power BI in the cloud and your on-premise data by kind of securing that link there. And what it does, it compresses, encrypts, and ships the data out to the cloud, only for the relevant data sets you need. The next thing is a role that Microsoft likes to call the data steward. And this is for giving users that type of capabilities to just start going off and making their own data sets and making their own queries and whatnot. That's what the data steward's for. The data steward is more of the business analyst who really understands the information and really understands when you can get yourself in trouble. So the, biz the data steward is kind of like the overseer of queries that users make up in their own queries. They can share the queries to different groups. They can, you know, make them, share them to the entire enterprise, or they can kind of, um, you know, what they say is certify queries. Say, yes, that query looks good or no, we should probably change that around to help uh, make that a more efficient query. Because you don't want to pull four terabytes of data if all you really need is a gigabyte of data. The last thing is, is that you can view and compare usage analytics of what is actually being used. So if a lot of people are accessing your sales data, you may want to take note of that and start you know, looking at maybe providing more access to that to help people get better insights. The next thing that Power BI offers is Q&A. Now, Q&A is what I said, natural language um, search capabilities, where similar to how I was working with Bing and I just typed in the word how, you, I start to explore different things and Q&A can also help out with that. So once you start typing out things, it will try to predict what you're looking for. And once you start, you know, kind of going through things, it'll start offering up suggestions for different bar charts or pie charts or map graphs, and so you don't actually have to make any of your own reports, you just have to ask the question and it will try to guess on what you're trying to do. And then, of course, you can go through and refine it. The last thing after Q&A is that they're starting to support heavy uh, mobile BI. Um, right now they have a mobile app for Windows 8 and they're due to be out with their Power BI mobile app for iOS in August. After that is going to be Android, but they also are moving heavily to HTML5. So even if you don't necessarily have those capabilities, if you work within the HTML5, <coughs> HTML5 framework, then you can also work with these different graphs and interact with it as well. When you mentioned iOS in August? Or? That's what they mentioned. So about two months ago, they said they were on track for August, uh, maybe three months ago. They said they were on track for August for iOS, and then soon after that would be Android. Is that an upgrade to the iOS 12 app also? Uh, I do not know that. That, I think, is a standalone Power BI app. That's how they've kind of displayed it to us when they were talking about it back then, is that it would be a new standalone app. So I kind of wanted to go through a couple different things with the Power BI demo. And 
those are, I want to ask a couple more questions. Okay, you know, how is crime trending over time, but can I predict where it will be in the future? Another one is how is crime doing by district and which is the worst district? And then maybe for that district, you know, what kind of crimes are taking place? What kind of descriptions are happening? So I'm going to jump into Power BI and display some of these. So this is Power BI. Um, first thing you can see is featured reports. So a lot of times you can share different reports with uh, other users in your group, and they can choose to say, make that a featured report, because I'm going to start looking at that more often. Another thing is featured questions. So if there's important questions or questions that you know you want to save for the future and stuff, you can save those. And you can attach your own icons if you want. Um, and the last thing is just kind of documents in general that you upload. Uh, this is where your like power pivot reports and you know workbooks are going to live. So one of the first things I wanted to see was you know how you know I kind of looked at how is crime trending over time, but Power BI started uh, released a feature where it kind of gave common users the ability to do their own predictive analytics. And we're going to look at that here in a second in HTML5. So. Power View originally was built in Silverlight, but that's why they're trying to move over to HTML5 because they want to make it universal. Not everyone has Silverlight, so right now you can actually use both of them if you'd like. So I'm, I just clicked the button over here to switch over to HTML5. And I'm going to go over and click over to this tab. So here is just kind of, you know, just a general graph of how crime has done over the months and years. We can see it's trending down as we kind of looked at before, but now there's a little icon over here that you can start to drag over and it will start to change your model to predict out what the future is going to hold. So as we're doing this, there's a couple things to notice. One, you can hover over again and try to see what the predictions are. Uh, two is that it detects seasonal, uh, it, de it detects seasonality automatically. But if you want, you can go ahead and set it to whether it's you know weekly or daily or whatever. You can set it to 52 or 365, and it will try to adjust for that. The second is the confidence interval. Now, it might show up kind of light, but if you want to say, you know, I don't want the exact numbers, I want to see kind of what the standard deviation shows me, you can drag this uh, confidence interval out, and it will say it's showing 68% of the expected values, and it's kind of light. Can you guys see that back there? OK, so it'll kind of show you where the range is for one standard deviation. And you can go ahead and drag it out to three standard deviations as well to see kind of where it's falling. Another thing to note is, you know, let's say, um, I don't know, let's say all the criminals left town in February of 2014. They just kind of got out of Chicago for the day, for the month. If you want and you think that this is kind of a one-off event and you kind of want to change it around, you can drag this up and down to adjust what the future predictions are going to be. So if there are one-off events and you kind of want to play around with it and see what if analyses of what's going to happen in the future, you can ch change the data and it will show you both what the old path was and what you dragged the new path to. So that's um, kind of the capability that they've offered with the more advanced um, HTML5 and the kind of predictive analytics to a common business user. Now, the next question is we wanted to kind of see how crime is doing by district. Um, this is where we're going to kind of go into Q&A and start just typing in stuff and seeing what comes up, and then we can kind of explore a little more. So there's a button up here in the right that says Ask with Power BI Q&A. And you can see a couple things. Um, I saved some questions down here. I attached my own icons. It said Batman was a crime fighter, so I went ahead and associated him with those. But I kind of want to just start typing them out so I can say, um, one second. I think my question was, how is crime doing by district? So I can type that out. 
five district lagging on me a little so you can see below it's already kind of it's kind of showing you what it uh, assumes that you're suggesting it says show crime in district so then what it's doing is it's taking the crime, it's adding it all up, and it's showing it by district, what are my worst offenders? So it looks like 11 and 8 are probably the worst offenders. Let's add a little bit of context to that. Uh, how is crime doing by district and type? And now it gives a little more context. We can see that 11 and 8 are still the lead offenders, and we can see what type of crime is going on in those certain districts. But the beautiful thing about this is, is you can just, you don't really have to program at all to get these to change to how you want. So if we wanted to do 100% stacked bar chart to see how they're doing just overall, what percentage of crime is going on, all you have to do is click on it. So I'd say let's go back to the bar chart and let's go ahead and filter the data. I don't really want to see all the small crimes that are going on and kind of what's happening. So there's a couple different uh, filters we can do. I'm going to say, give me all the crime where it's above, uh, let's do about 3,000. So now it only filtered it to the primary types where there was a lot more of that type of crime. And we can see that 11 actually fell down to the bottom, and 8 and 4 rose above it. So of the primary types of crime, District 8 would probably be the worst. So we kind of looked at what was happening, you know, who, ha who was the worst offender. We can go ahead and say, let's give a little more detail on what's happening in 8. And since this is character data, I'm going to do it because uh, 008, it would interpret it as a number. So I'm going to say, um, let's say crime by description and type for district 8. And right there, it'll show me. So the description is a finer grain detail of what type of crime is going on. And it automatically orders it from greatest to largest. I can go ahead and you know, take that out if I want, if I just want to see what type is going on. Or I can do it the other way if I want to order it differently. So there's a lot of different ways you can interact with this Q&A feature. Okay, so I answered a couple different questions on what's going on with Q&A, what's, um, what's kind of happening, you know, with uh, crime over time and how can we kind of predict it as an end user, business user. Um, how is crime doing by district and what type is going on? So you can see with, you know, the enhancements they're making, and some of these were just released a couple months ago. Yes, you know, like the predictive analytics capability, that was released in, I believe it was May. So they're constantly iterating, constantly adding new features, and it's really about trying to provide more power to the end user, but maybe kind of get it more to be about sharing and collaboration with the data steward and being able to share those different groups and whatnot. Um, so that's pretty much, you know, Excel 2013 and Power BI. Does uh, anyone have any questions? Scalable, so right now the workbooks can go up to, I think, 500 megabytes, um, which are huge for the workbooks. I mean, this one I was working with was tiny. Um, as far as scalable, it's, I think it scales up to Office 3, how many Office 365 users you have. Um, so this goes on the premise that a user must know the tables in which they're joining together. For example, let's say we put this on top of a data warehouse, mm -hmm. and we've got, let's say, 150 tables. Mm -hmm. They would have to know then how the tables relate, like do a star scheme or something like that to get what they want. Yeah, if they, well, so a lot of times they focus this for not just business users, but power users as well. So a lot of times if you're saying all the data is out in a data warehouse or a data mart and stuff, then yeah, they would have to have a little bit of understanding. Now, what can happen is a lot of times is the data steward who understands that stuff can set that up for them. And 
when you're sharing the queries, you can give descriptions and names and different things to help users, you know, and users just search through and find which query they want, which might contain the data that the data steward offers. So Microsoft is really big on, you know, giving end users and power users the ability, but if it's like something like a data warehouse, that's where you may ask more of the data steward or someone who really truly understands the data to build out the data set for them and then they can iterate on it as well. So what you just said is, so theoretically, your top power users could create, uh, let's say, data models that they would then share out with somebody and that way the average user doesn't have to piece it all together. They're going to start with something and start building it. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's exactly it. And, and a lot of times it is about that sharing. So they first introduced power pivot models with Sharon and team BI sites and stuff, and that was what their scalable solution was. And now they're thinking that it can go bigger than that, you know, kind of with a um, like cloud solution and being able to integrate with the domains and stuff kind of the same way. How is it, to, how is it uh, easy to secure the data based on the, basically the users? Oh, so um, how it kind of works is with the data query, so you would lock that down at the database level, but if you didn't lock, let's say you gave everyone access to that, if um, they, they could try to use a powerful tool, Informatica, to get it themselves if you didn't lock it down at all, but if you went ahead and said only any, anyone can get through it through Power BI, the data steward can choose which groups are shared with that. So you're kind of authenticated through that way as well, through the groups you're in in the domain. What about scheduling capability? So I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a power user and I want to run this query every day at 8 a.m. Does that have any type of scheduling where you can set it up? Yes. Yes. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Where, where are the queries run? Are they someone, is it, is it run on the, the data source itself? Um, um, the queries, on the data source itself. So yeah, they're executed against the data source. They can be, excuse me, they're run in um, Power BI with the data gateway. Yeah, so they're executed against the data source from Power BI, so it's encrypted and shipped. It's not gonna like pull down the data source. No, no, it, it, it'll execute it against it and then pull it and compress it, encrypt it, and ship it. Assuming the user has the right to go to the database Shared this out to Matic, or every time he runs the report, he's going to run that query against the database. He has those rights to do refresh against the Yeah, so. Yeah, so um, the way, well, you can set up like scheduled refresh within it, and it doesn't do a full pull the whole time. There's, um, you can kind of set it up to do, so what, what I've done is for like the Chicago data, if I want to grab like the last 10 days, it wouldn't pull all two and a half years, it would just pull the last 10 days. Cool. Any other questions? Is it ODBC, SQL? Um, it's, over built, back in? it's built in drivers. Um, ODBC is not supported at this time, but they are supporting that in the future. They've talked about that capability coming. So infrastructure wise, is it only using Microsoft SQL back in? Uh, no, it can support, yeah, it can support a lot of different databases. They have a lot of different ones, Teradata, Oracle, most of the traditional ones, and non and there's some non-traditional I went over as well. Um, JDBC, I believe that's another, that's with ODBC, is that it's set up to be the future. Yeah, and, and that's the good thing is that, you know, it's not like you have to download and update, like, you have to go through an update process is that they'll just tell you one day, hey, we support ODBC now. It's like, oh, okay. Like, and, and that's how they've been with a lot of the updates. Yeah. Cool. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Well, was, like I, say, I, I was reading out there about the cost. Is this a pay as you go type of thing? In other words, if I have five power users, that I pay per power user to use this, or do you buy this as an implementation that you actually own at your? It's per it's per month. So the same way that like Office 365 and stuff like that is kind of like a per month cost. Uh, power BI is the same way. Per user, sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. No, no. Yeah, I, I meant to say no. Yeah, per per user per month. Yes, that's a difference. <laughs>
Okay, so any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs>